the, the works are not at all uh, made with uh, digital techniques exclusively. Um, we call it the digital canon because it's artworks that left their marks in the field of digital art and digital culture, as we call it uh, nowadays. But some are uh, like even a complete celebration of, and we will see some examples today, of uh, analog techniques. But um, these works do have their continuation into the contemporary uh, field. And um, sometimes it's also just a matter of making a statement. Uh, a canon is making a statement, and call it a digital canon was also making a statement. And you can say, like, works made with analog and digital techniques, the gift, the mark, and the way, and but, yeah, but just like it needed to have some impact. So there's this website uh, with all these works. We did some research into all of these works, and that is all uh, made accessible on this website. Some context, some images, and then we had this list of 20 works made publicly in, uh, on the internet. But many of these works exist pure um, by means of documentation. It's uh, early net artworks that are made on like previous iterations of the web and don't exist in any form nowadays or networked performances. Uh, that uh, move on in, in the heads of many people and in some source code here and there or maybe a tape there with an image that was used. Um, so we brought this documentation together on this website that our deepest wish was to make the, web, the, the, the artworks visible for a larger audience. And the only way to do that, there are many ways, but a good way to do that is making an exhibition with them, because then at least you need to think of a physical representation of the work in the space. Um, and with this list, we went to a new institute in Rotterdam to, uh, to ask if we could collaborate on making an exhibition with these 20 artworks. Um, and that's where the story ends, so that's where, where, where we are um, now. A new institute accepted, and together with their curator, Klaas Kuitenbrauer, I made this list of 20 works into a proposal for a show, for an exhibition, um, which will open on October 7th. And this is the process that we call digital care, the trajectory that leads towards this exhibition, to see how we can um, give these works a physical presentation in the exhibition. And, and uh, this moment where we are here with you, it's the, it's the first um, uh, presentation within the framework of digital care, is think collectively with like, people from the field of how a work could be made visible in this exhibition and such, and also to give them some uh, historical, technical, art historical contextualization. So uh, today's program is uh, focused on um, two works from this list of 20. And um, they are uh, ready to be uh, screened uh, here in the space. And we will take this information and this, this, this conversation and, and these ideas into the further development of the, of the exhibition that will open in a couple of months. So very happy to have you all here to uh, watch this happen and think along with us. And, um, and I'm going to give the word to uh, Joost Rechveld. Jos Rechveld is uh, a researcher and an artist himself, and there's also an artwork by Joost um, in the digital canon, so that will also be on view in uh, Rotterdam from October on. Um, and yeah, we can even say he works in line with, or like even so with, with the heritage of the two works that are presented here, and uh, I'm going to leave it there and give the word to Joost. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for denying the great weather. 
in green here. Um, I'm going to talk about these two works uh, by Rivinus van der Bund and uh, Steiner. And I'm going to talk about uh, things which they share. And they share a couple of things. I was thinking also on the way here, I don't know many artists, video artists, who are known by their first names. And the two ones I know are Steiner and Levinus, uh, which are these two people, um, because they have a beautiful first name, like Levinus. I also don't know anybody else who is actually called Levinus. I don't know if you do. Um, so that's one thing they join, which is a bit superficial. And another thing they join uh, is the fact that they, I think, both have a quite a big influence on the media arts climate in the Netherlands. Like Steiner is very well known as a video artist. I think like Steiner would not the perhaps for some lot of people actually more or less defined what video art could be, or at least showed one way of what it could be. Uh, so they had a tremendous influence. And Steiner was for a while in the nineties, she was artistic director of Stein, which is a place in Amsterdam which isn't exist anymore, but where she was also really active and influenced a lot of people. Uh, also influenced a lot of technical developments, which also had some influence on my own work. Uh, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and then Venus, uh, I think, also had a tremendous influence on a few things. Like Luma is one of the sort of inheritors of uh, several in initiatives, but one of them was Montevideo, which was one of the first video art uh, spaces in the Netherlands which was founded by René Coelho, who was very much inspired by the uh, ideas of uh, living this from the bent about video. And René Coelho, if I'm not mistaken, was also one of the founders or important people in the genesis of the media arts department here at uh, Aki. So there's lots of um, reasons. In fact, we were talking about Lima preserving his works in the school. has, I think, also a lot to do with sort of the heritage of these uh, people and their ideas. Um, so, uh, what I want to do is first I will talk about uh, Levinus and a bit about Yip, his son from the Bund, uh, and especially, of course, about the work, Mare, uh, and then I will talk, do more of the same with Steiner, and also talk a bit about Widi. So, I will talk about uh, Steiner for uh, you know, word, and give a bit of back, background, and I will talk about uh, the violent power uh, work. And then I will point out some similarities between the work of uh, Levinus and uh, Steiner. So I will talk about core music, I will talk about social things, and then I will, the rest of the time I will talk most about what I've, yeah, the sort of aspects they both share, and which is something which is more an attitude, which I think a lot of video artists have or had at late in that period. Uh, and which is really about a certain relationship to the tools. And that Steiner had this beautiful formulation dialogue with the tools, which they use quite a bit. Um, and that's something I think she put a lot of things in words, which Levinus was also doing, but did not put in words, but that's uh, speculation on my part. Um, and also it uh, aligns very much with the kind of things I'm doing myself. So that's also one of the reasons I think I'm here. Uh, because I've been doing in the last six years a project which was called Dialogues with Machines, and I thought, okay, I find this very beautiful new title. And then one of the things I found out is that Steiner already had these ideas of the dialogue with the tools, uh, like before I was even born. So, yeah, there you go. Um, so, that's sort of what I want to do. And before, so this is Levinus. I think we should watch the work. So, we have two works. So, I might proposition is that we first watch uh, the first work by Levinus, SMRA. It will be on that monitor over there. That's part of the work. I mean, that's also part of the Lima. It was my... Um, so that's also, I must admit, I have shown this work several times. I, one of the things I do, I also make film programs. So I've been showing it in, in cinemas. Uh, knowing that that's not really perhaps the way it was intended. Uh, and so in fact, the way this work was intended was to be shown on the monitor like this. Um, so that is what we will do. Yes.
Okay, so there was uh, Moiré, uh, it's from, nine, between, he made it between 1972 and 1976, and he made it together with uh, Yeap from the Bund, who was his son. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the history of Levinus. Uh, the reason I knew of him first was because he was the found, one of the founders of the Free Academy in The Hague. I don't know if that rings a bell with some of you. Uh, the Free Academy doesn't exist anymore, uh, but it existed for, well, it was founded in 47, so it existed for more than uh, half a century. And it was uh, founded as a kind of alternative to the academy. So it was the idea was to have a, a free academy, which was less academical, so which was open for everybody, which was less selective, more inclusive. Um, and the idea was basically, and I think it's also like I, I, I spent some time there because I had a great film department, like Franz Swartjes was the film teacher. Um, and at that time, it was in the 90s, they still had the same policies that basically any, anyone who wanted could join. Uh, so the first entrance requirement formulated by Livinus, who was the founder and the director for the first 20 years, was basically that everybody who could hold a pen or a pencil or a, a brush was welcome uh, and could just uh, join the academy and become a student. So it was extremely open. Uh, so they did not make any divisions between like outsider art, insider art, like the whole idea was to make this place where everybody could uh, study art. Um, and I found this one phrase, like it was founded in 47, so it's just after the Second World War. So I found this phrase, uh, which was sort of one statement I found by Levinus about uh, this founding. I will read it first in Dutch and then in English. We hopen door de kunst een tegenwicht te geven tegen de technische wetenschappen die alleen maar leiden tot de overal waarneembare vernietigingstendens. Nu wetenschap en techniek zijn uitgelopen op de constructie van atoombommen. So in English, we hope uh, through art to give a counterweight, um, a counterforce against the technical sciences that uh, only lead to the um, tendence, tendency of destruction we can see everywhere. And now, uh, because now science and technology have uh, ended or have sort of led to the construction of atom bombs. So this was just a few years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, so the idea was, okay, we, we need more art and we need everybody to be able to participate in this art. Uh, so Livinius himself in 47, he was already uh, more or less an established artist. He was a very traditional artist, like he, he studied drawing, painting, uh, lithography. Um, he, he had studied in Paris in Atelier uh, 17. And what he, what they refer to in the Free Academy was the Parisian method. It's like, basically it's a workshop where teachers pass by and sort of share their knowledge and that people are more or less all on the same plane. Like also there's not so much a division between students and uh, teachers. Um, so Livinus for a long time was working with, uh, yeah, traditional graphic techniques, you could say. And at some point, like in the, like in the early fifties, he started working with light directly. He, he was always interested in light, but he, um, imagined or he invented this, uh, new way to make pictures, which he called photo peinture. And it was basically looking at using light, a different way to, to draw light on photographic paper. So he was using a bundle of glass fiber and then putting a light through it. And then in a dark room, he was using this as a kind of brush to, to spread the light on photo paper and then develop it in the dark room and then uh, make uh, abstract images like that. So that we called uh, photo peinture. And then in the 50s, uh, so that was actually quite late in his career, it was more or less, you could also see it as a kind of second career. I mean, he had lots of exhibitions as a graphic artist and painter. Uh, and later he became more and more involved in using technology in his work. And then he started basically using all kinds of machines or building machines which did things with light. Uh, so there's a couple of machines uh, described. I've never seen any of these machines working. Uh, there's one machine which, you, which is called DiscoVisi, uh, which is basically, it's sometimes described that he invented the, the image disc but it's basically a kind of record player with slides on it. And then there was another record player with some kind of sender on it and they were connected. And I have never found a description which really explains how it worked and what it actually did. But it was somehow projecting, it was some kind of automated projector which could project uh, abstract images. 
Um, he also made uh, what he called chromo pentures. So these were like kinetic boxes with an image in it, which changed color. So the idea, like if you read the descriptions, it's mostly that they were, what was special about them is not so much that the shapes changed, but that the colors changed. It was a kind of programmed color. Uh, compositions, you could you could say, so he, they were exposed as uh, yeah, in exhibitions. Um, and then uh, he kept evolving his way of working with light, like he, uh, he, built, he built also outdoor installations. There was an installation by, uh, from him on, a, on, a, on the roof of a building in Arnhem for, for a very long time. It was demolished, I think, at the end of the 90s. Um, and then he, at some point he built a machine which I have actually seen but not working, uh, which was the, called the Lumino Dynamic Machine and he built two. Uh, and he played it, like he toured with this machine, it could be played manually, it had a keyboard, and it could play a, a kind of sequence of projected abstract images uh, through some kind of uh, recording which was included in it. And I found a little uh, announcement uh, from the newspaper in 1965, uh, because he played it in the, in the Hague, in the Gemeente Museum, it was the start of this tour. Uh, I will again read it first in Dutch and then in, uh, in English. Uh, Levinus bespeelt zijn lichtorgel, dat is de kop van het artikel, 13 maart 1965. Levinus van de Bund, de directeur van de Haagse Vrije Academie en uitvinder van een door hemzelf in toepassing gebracht systeem om te schilderen met licht als verf, bespeelde vanmiddag voor het eerst zijn lumodynamische machine die in het gemeentemuseum staat opgesteld. In dit museum wordt een tentoonstelling gehouden van zijn lichtschilderingen. Levinus, zoals, zoals, zoals hij als kunstenaar kortweg wordt genoemd, zal tot en met 11 april elke zaterdag en zondagmiddag concerteren om drie uur en om kwart voor vier. Om iedere zaterdagmorgen tot en met die datum om kwart voor twaalf zal het lichtorgel automatisch spelen volgens een door Livinus op de band vastgelegde informatie. I really like this sort of time warp. So it's a news, a very short news clipping from 13th of March 1965. Uh, Livinus plays his light organ with a lot of quotes like this. Uh, so Livinus van der Bund, the director of the De Hague Free Academy, an inventor of a, uh, of, um, of a, yeah, I'm, I'm translating this real time, I'm not very good at it, I'm sorry, uh, of, a, um, of a, yeah, himself invented system to paint with light as it, it was uh, paint, uh, plays this af will play this afternoon for the first time his Lumo Dynamic Machine, which is uh, uh, installed in the, in the Gemeente Museum in De Hague. Uh, and in the museum, there, there's also an exhibition of his light paintings. Levinus, which is his artist name, will play until the 11th of April, every Saturday and Sunday afternoon. He will play a concert at three o'clock and um, uh, at its uh, quarter to four. Every Saturday morning, um, the light organ will play automatically according to uh, uh, information which was recorded uh, by Levinus on tape. So, this was 1965, and around that time, probably a bit later, he met Dum Jung Paik, who had just invented video art. Like, video art started with more or less, I mean, it's one of the points which is often mentioned as the beginning of video art, is that Nam Jung Paik had an exhibition in 1963 in Germany. And Nam Jung Paik was from Korea, we'll talk about him later, I have a picture of him later. Um, he was originally a composer, like he came from the world of composed music, so he was studying with Stockhausen, he, was, he knew John Cage very well, uh, so he was in a sort of musical uh, context of, of thinking, let's say, and he had this exhibition which he called Ex Exposition of Music, um, Electronic Television, it was in 1963, and it was basically an exhibition of hacked television, so he was like, he had television sets like that. Uh, from the early 60s, uh, and he had hacked them with, you know, magnets and all kinds of things as a way to compose the signal or to compose these images. So that was sort of the beginning of video art, and then Levinus was sort of right there, like already very quickly, he, yeah, he knew about these people, he met them, uh, and he became really interested in, in, uh, in doing things with video himself. Uh, he never really had the tools, but he went to the United States, do different things, and then at some point in 1970, he did a residency um, in Vancouver, and there it's basically the moment that he really started making video himself. It was in 1970, and it's interesting to also realize in 1970, uh, like Levinus was built, born in 1909, uh, so in 1970 he was already 61, so it's like really at sort of, he had already a whole career, and then 
quite late, he was still sort of exploring all these new tools he could find and trying to make them his own. So he started really experimenting with video. Uh, he bought, when he came back from Vancouver, he bought this uh, video camera and he started fiddling around with televisions and finding ways that he could do it himself, uh, all these video techniques. Um, there's also stories that he built a video synthesizer and that he built a video colorizer. Um, the colorizer may have been used in, in, the, in the work we just saw, Moiré. Uh, the synthesizer, I've never seen pictures of it and I'm also not aware of any uh, tapes we know which were built, of, made with a video synthesizer he built, so I don't know if that actually was really true. Um, but he was experimenting with lots of different ways to make video signals, hack video signals, uh, together with his son, Yape. And Jaip uh, van der Bund was a musician, like he was playing drums in the bands, and together they really got also into the sort of, uh, what well, you could say, the 60s vibe. Like they did all kinds of light shows. Uh, one thing which Levinus also invented was a kind of drum, that if you played it, it would also emit light. So they used this in, also in, in concerts. Uh, together, like Levinus and Jaip, they also did light shows for other bands. Um, so they were really also developing uh, not only all these new tools to shape light or to play with it or to make it interactive or playable or composable, uh, but also finding all these different places where to show it. Uh, so not only in, uh, in galleries and museums, but also in you know, concert halls and all these different things. Um, and then sort of in the 70s, so like he came back from Vancouver in the 70s, that's what he quotes as sort of his really beginning of becoming a video artist. Uh, and then like 73, he made his first tapes and then Moiré is like 72, 76, and he made a couple of other works in the same uh, period. Um, so because of that, he is called mostly the kind of forerunner of Dutch video art, like he's, I think, the first Dutch video artist who actually was really working on the signal, which in general, if you look, if you zoom out a bit, if you look at the early history of video art, there's basically, well, one way to divide it in two groups is to say there's one group, you could perhaps say there's three groups, and two of them were really working with cameras as a way of documenting. So you have artists who were documenting their own performances, for instance, that's a whole group of uh, video artists. Then there are video artists who really come more from activism, using these cameras also as a political tool. We will talk about it a little bit later. Uh, so using also the fact that, you know, video is a very democratic medium. And then you have this group which Levinus and Steina were part of as people who are really interested in the signal, like getting their hands dirty by sort of putting them inside these machines and fiddling with the wires and, and these kind of things. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to interrupt if you, if I'm not clear or whatever. Just Okay, so I talked a little bit about Levinus um, and to talk about the work. I mean, we just saw it. I have lots of stills, but it makes no sense to show them um, because we just saw the work. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the work itself. Uh, it was actually, it's also really interesting to look at how he made it or how they made it because it's Jaip and Levinus. And the first part, I was really, I mean, I knew this work, but I never really uh, found out uh, until recently how it was actually made. And the interesting thing is that the video generator for this work, for the first part, it's the, there's two uh, ways of working in the film, like this in the, in the piece, like it's the first half and the second half. And the first half, there's basically two sources of the signal. And the first source is very, for me, very surprising, is the video game Pong. I don't know if you ever played Pong. I mean, I did, and it's indeed it's like the old version of Pong is like this little box you could buy in the store, and it was really expensive, and we were very happy that we got it for Sinterklaas uh, at some point. And then you plug it in the back of your television, and then the, the video signal from this computer game sort of goes into your television, and your television becomes the monitor. This is before computers, like people didn't have monitors. The only thing they had at home was a television. So what it does, you have this box which generates a video signal, and if you turn the knobs, the, the little, you know, the little player cube on the screen sort of moves. So that cube you see in the beginning of the piece is actually the Pong cube. I never realized that, but that's also what you see on the screen here now. Uh, and basically, so that's one source, and the other source is also a really crude hack. You can try this at home. If you have, if you happen to have like an old fashioned television, is that basically you can feed uh, the video input, you can just put in sound. 
and then you will see things happen on the screen which are directly related to the sound. So if you look in the first part of this piece, basically you have these two sources, so you have these little cubes moving around which are the Pong cubes, and then you have Yay playing music, and then it's also fed in, so you see that the, the cube sort of reacts to the sound because it's being displaced and moved around also by the, the signal which is also fed directly into the, the television. And then it was filmed from the screen and then uh, colorized. So that's extremely simple. Um, but I was, yeah, I was really, so it's really also comes really from this. I mean, I can really also imagine this, this feeling that you arrive from this center where they have, you know, all these tools, expensive cameras, all kinds of equipment, and you arrive at home and you don't have any of this. And what can you do? And you just fiddle around and you find ways that you can just hack the signal. So that's the. Yeah. Yeah, but that's the second part. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's the second part because I was talking about the first part. <laughs> that's okay. But the second part, like you explained it very well, that's, that's, that's basically a kind of stop motion almost where you have these different slides. And you see the second part basically consists of uh, images like this, which some of them were also filmed, uh, taken from TVs, but some of them were also his chromo peinture, like the, the things, he, abstract images he made with photography. Uh, and then it was more or less traditional animation. So you, you film a little bit and you, you basically fade in and fade out and then you re rewind the camera and you do like cross fades basically. You did it in a very simple way, but it was made on film and then transferred to video, polarized, and then put together with the first part. So that's these two uh, parts. Um, I don't know, I think we can move on. I don't know if there's any other questions or... Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, so basically, if you, I mean, we, we will, I mean, after the talk, we will show the, the works again and we can see them again. Um, but basically what you see, like this is the little cube of Pong. And then at some point in the video, things like this happen, like they become blurry and they move around. And basically they move around because the, the, the Pong cube signal is sort of interfering or working together with this sound signal, which is fed in. And, and basically if you feed in a sound, uh, signal directly to a, a TV, like an old TV. Basically what happens, like if you have a sound, like, I don't know, I don't know you, so I don't know what you know about sound, perhaps what I am explaining to you is you all know the things, but like a sound is basically a frequency. So if you have a tone, like you say, ah, you have a frequency like this. And basically that means that if you keep the good tone, you will see like bars, like horizontal bars on the, on the, on the television, because it's just, that signal you put in is directly translated to the image you see in the television. So it's not, you can say it, it reacts, but it's actually even more basic than that. Like what you see is actually the sound signal. Uh, so you see these horizontal bars. So that's also the things you see here on the screen. These bars are actually generated by the percussion sounds Yape is making at that point in the video, because that sound was going directly into the television. And then it also sort of blurs these, these, these Pong cubes, like it's sort of mixed with it. So it's a way, because it's analog, and because if you have like an electronic sound signal, it's all just, you know, like waves traveling through wires, you can just mix them and plug them in the television. Like you don't have, with digital, that it's not the right format or whatever. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just a signal. So it's in that way, it's really very direct. And that's also what I like about it, is that this is the first video artwork and it's really, a, a crazy hack that's what's, what's, what's so nice about it. Yeah, it's Livinus, so that's the guy I've been talking about mostly, uh, and his son, Yape, who was, I think, uh, this time he was around, he was born in 59, I think, so uh, calculating very quickly. So he was young, I mean, it's like a sort of 18 years. Uh, somebody can do the math while I'm talking. Are they being polarized? 
Well, that's a very good question, uh, which I don't know the answer. I'm looking at you, but he, like I, I read somewhere that he built a color right. So that's perhaps uh, one the, the way, like because I know the second part, like they they filmed it on 16 millimeter film, and then they uh, transferred the film to video. So I imagine that during that step, they must have colorized it. Uh, and uh, these little cubes here, for instance, the fact that they have this uh, this colored bands is actually that they were on the television. There's this uh, like if if you have a color television, you can basically mess around with the colors that the colors don't come at the right place, and that's what they did. So they were also hacking their. It wasn't color television. Yeah, it was a color television. Yeah. <laughs> But the pong is just white. But then, because you sort of uh, adjust it badly, you have you get basically this white cube with colored edges, and then they colorize it. So, um, sorry, I don't know. No, I don't know. But I heard this colorizer mentioned that he had built. So I guess, uh, and it also, I mean, to be honest, the color is also quite uh, like it looks also like he just uh, did, just did not have one channel or something, or he had channels around something like that. I think it's also quite. Yeah. Fundamental or basic, depending. Yeah. Yeah. But what I find interesting about, like, I, I know a lot of images of these early video pioneers, and you see, always see them with their gear. And I have not seen any picture of Levinus with gear, except this, this great picture I like a lot, uh, where he's sort of like on this television. Um, but uh, that's the only picture I know of him with video gear. So I'm a bit, uh, I'm a bit skeptical. Like, I don't know if I were him and I built, you know, I will show a picture of my gear later. Well, that's what you do. <laughs> you sort of, you know, you make pictures of your gear. Uh, yeah, that's a good. No, that must no color film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There can't be otherwise. Yeah, otherwise you cannot. Yeah. 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 It could be. Yeah. That could also be. Yeah. Yeah, because I read that he he did a transfer in. Well, this is a very getting a bit into a sort of a nerdy. <laughs> like we're losing a bit of the audience, so I'm looking a bit at you. Uh, but um, uh, I yeah, I read that they did this transfer in Utrecht, where they had apparently some kind of video studio, so they might also have had a key machine. I don't know what. Uh, really. Okay, so perhaps we stop about Levinus. We will come back to him later, and then we will. Um, I'm uh, Okay. I go to this and then we go to uh, Steina, who's on the right here on this picture. Um, perhaps we can, uh, oh, I can do it with my uh, remote. So we watch again uh, the violin power, the work by, uh, by Steina. Um, no, 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 no. Um, so we will then move to, and then I will talk about uh, that work. Thank you. 
Okay, so there was violin power, one of the many versions which exist, 1970-1978. Uh, these on the screen are the Woody and Steiner. Um, and we're mostly talking about Steiner here. Uh, so Steiner is, well, like Woody, they are a different generation than Levinas, like they were born like almost 30 years later. Uh, and Steiner was uh, from Iceland originally, and she was a classically trained violin player. Uh, and at some point, I have to look at the year, 1959, she got a scholarship to study classical violin in Prague. And Prague was behind the Iron Curtain, so it was like a different planet, very far away. Very few people went there and came back, I don't know, but like it's, you know, like it's uh, really a different world than now. Um, and there uh, she met uh, Woody and they married in 64, also partly to get him out of the communist world and into the Western world. It was also a bit of sort of transactional. And at some point they ended up, and Woody was a filmmaker, film student, and at some point, like just after they married, they ended up in New York. And what I really like about the beginning of their video is it's, it seems almost uh, autobiographical. So you hear her in the first uh, f uh, shot, you see her playing the piece. I forgot which one it was, but it's a classical piece. And then the second, it's like we all melt and it's Let It Be and the Beatles and it's all crazy. And, uh, and that's, I think, captures really well the, what happened to them when they moved to New York and found themselves in the middle of the underground in New York. And Woody was a filmmaker. At some point he got, uh, through his film contacts, he got in touch with people who were like doing early video stuff. So he, at some point he could buy one of the first uh, portable video cameras, the Porta Pack, and he basically started recording all these crazy people around them. So Andy Warhol, the Velvet Underground, all these sort of famous New York uh, art uh, crowd, and all other kinds of people, and lots of drugs and crazy, and they were, you know, leading the life. Uh, you could say there's a great documentary, uh, The Vazulka Effect. If you're interested in these things, really watch it. It's a fantastic story of their art work and their, you know, like nerdy video stuff, but also this world of this, you know, like crazy uh, stuff. So, that, and I like really much uh, in this work, like you have all these sections of different ways the music interacts also, but also different versions of her almost. And I like really this difference between the first shot and the second is really, I think, telling or it's a beautiful image, I think, of this, what happened to them. Um, so around 69, they really got into video. So also the first shot you see in the film is one of the first things they shot with the Porta Pack camera. Um, and they got really into, into exploring video as not as a kind of cheap substitute for film or television, but as a medium with its own possibilities and affordances and all these kind of things. So this is a picture from much later, but this is a bit how I came to know them as, you know, like from my interest in video, as people who were really trying to get their hands dirty on the signal and also were not afraid to develop their own technologies or work with people who developed technologies for them. So that's, I think, also with a big difference, like they not only, you know, is a difference of a generation in age with Levinas, but also in their approach. It's partly perhaps also because of their environment, but they surrounded themselves with like engineer type people, nerds, crazy, brilliant, mostly guys building stuff for them, uh, which then they used in their, uh, in their experiments. And they were not, uh, well, they, they are tapes, and there are also tapes which they sort of edited and finished, but a lot of their work is just tapes and tapes full of experiments. And really the tapes also work like this. For me, they're more like sort of um, symptoms of a whole sort of process of research and just playing around, trying things out which was, I think is really the core of their work. Like uh, in Iceland, they have now this archive of their uh, video tapes, and it's hours and hours and hours of material like this. And, and what we've seen you know, in exhibitions is like tiny snippets, which they sort of put together at some point, and then at a later point they put, made a slightly different edit. But I think their real work is this process of you know, trying things out and exploring and exploring and working with all these new uh, technologies. And in the process of doing that, as 
autodidacts, like non-specialists, they sort of learned how this stuff worked. And they also they invented lots of stuff, or they were really early in sort of developing things. Like they were really early in, for instance, working with digital video techniques because they had people sort of figuring out with them, like almost at the same time when sort of the big industries were sort of building the first big machines for the television studios, they were also in their studio working on some crazy people doing more or less the same thing, but in a way which was driven by artistic questions and not by sort of questions of efficiency or, or yeah, commercial uh, concerns. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is them uh, much later. Um, so they worked a lot as a couple and it was actually quite later that they also really started making work separate. So there was, I think, end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, they really also started working, like on the tape it still says the Vazulkas. Uh, but then later you had like Woody Vazulka made his own works and then Steiner also made installations and, and uh, mostly installations actually um, and all kind of uh, video works. Um, so one of the tools they used a lot and which you also see at the end of the of the of this piece is this device we'll talk about it later the Red Etra uh, scan processor or video synthesizer and this is uh, an image of Steiner her portrait uh, sort of using this machine um, so it was also one of these machines which was sort of built by well I, I will come back to it later also uh, by Steve Rudd and Bill Etra who were like engineers, Bill Etra was also a video artist, um, and they built this machine as, uh, they were actually hoping to sell this to like television studios, for instance, but they ended up mostly selling it to video artists like Gary Hill and the Vazulkas, and there's a couple of people like that who still have them and also use them. Uh, and it was a machine which you could also, yeah, configure yourself and, and use in your own uh, studios. And the reason I know about these things is that I got at some point also really interested in working with, like after making films on film, like celluloid, like mechanical machines, and after writing code for a long time, I got really interested also in working with signals. So I started revisiting all these technologies and building my own uh, studio full of gear. Uh, and then at some point I also made a piece which is sort of in homage to the Vazulkas and their experiments with this particular uh, Rudd Etra. Uh, scan processor. So this is my own look. What you do when you have a Rod Etra scan processor, you make an auto portrait process. So this is me when I was doing this, a bit more distorted. And this was me talking to them, like a Skype meeting with them about this project when Woody was also still alive. Um, okay, so in the so I talked a bit about. Uh, going back to the violent power piece like this first change how that is sort of autobiographical in the sense that it you see the change of yeah of steiner really playing a piece and then later sort of going all beatles um and what you also see in the in the sections is that there is also you see also kind of evolution in the kind of technologies they were exploring um, and at some point, uh, the installation work Steiner was making, this is a, a, a picture of an installation she made, which is called All Vision. Uh, and it consists of this big ball and there's two cameras and then they, they, they turn around this ball and then you see that image on two uh, screens. Uh, and that's, I think, typical also. It's a kind of, yeah, kind of microcosm or kind of image made to be put in a museum or gallery of the type of thing they were doing in the studio and especially Steiner was doing in the studio like they had a lot of these sessions where they would in the studio set up some kind of arrangement like Steiner would there be there playing the violin or doing funny stuff in front of the camera and then they had this whole setup like this image being processed and then seen again on monitors and being re scanned and all these kind of things so they were really trying out the possibilities of one particular arrangement and I think that's really what you see in this in this violin power. You see all the different sections with all a different arrangement of how uh, Steiner is present in the image and also how her violin playing affects the image. Um, uh, so I will go a little bit. So this is the first shot, and then I mean I don't have images of all the shots, but I can give you a sort of outline. And then uh, like the first shot you see her just playing, and then the second is with the Beatles where you see her playing. And then at some point, the, you see a first, the first image, which is sort of treated. 
you see that the, the sound of the violin is sort of transposed. So instead of hearing the violin sound, you hear a sound which is much lower in frequency. And that sound is then switching the image between two, so you see two images of Steiner, sort of filmed from the same angle more or less, and they're sort of switching, and the sound does the switching. So the sound is directly uh, influencing the image. And then there's variations of that. So at some point you see this horizontal bar, which I just explained uh, when I was talking about uh, Yape sound sort of, um, yeah, creating a video image. So you see the same, the same horizontal bars, but then here also they're actually used to switch between two camera positions uh, looking at Steiner. And then you get images like these, where you really see the signal, uh, where the signal is actually, the sound wave is sort of displacing the image horizontally. So instead of having a straight violin bow line, you see it becomes all fuzzy because the sound waves are sort of pushing it in different uh, directions. And you can also see that how it changes with the music. And then after that, you see this part, which is made with this Red Atra synthesizer, where you can do a lot of more processing and where this uh, relationships become more complex, where you see also these things which look a bit more like um, uh, like scanning or like echo images or like they look like electronic abstract images, but they're effect. If you look at them, you still see her movement of playing the violin, and you can see that it's actually still an image of her, but processed in such a way that you cannot really recognize it anymore if you're not familiar with the output of this uh, Rotetra device. Does that make sense? Is that a bit clear? Yeah. And then, so that's sort of this, there's different versions of this video uh, containing slightly different fragments and slightly different edits. So, but this is really uh, one sort of stage of existence of this work. It's like this sequence of different experiments with her violin and then added it into a tape. And then much later, uh, so that's also the, well, it started a bit before, but it was also the time when she was in Stein, for instance, in Amsterdam. She had a, a, a period where she used to, she did a different version of this work, which also technically was quite different, but where it also was a performance. And in fact, what she did, she, she got a MIDI violin, so instead of producing sounds, it produces uh, uh, MIDI data, which can control synthesizers. And instead of controlling synthesizers, she was controlling like image devices, like for instance, a laser disc player, or uh, in the case of when she was working at Stein, she had this software developed, which was called Imagine, uh, where you could basically, if you have a, a video clip, you can sort of scroll through this video clip and then her violin bow does the scrolling. So you can really use a violin as a video editing tool or as a VJ tool or as a video playing interface. Um, so that's sort of second phase, and I think the, the versions which are going to be included in this exhibition of the digital canon is, is this, the, the early version, and not the, the second one, if, I, uh, if I'm correct. Um, yeah, so this is kind of a different chapter of this, this work. Okay, so I talked about Levinus, I talked about uh, Steiner, and then I want to talk about similarities, and I see that I already have to hurry because I have lots of things prepared, which I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to talk about all of them, but I will be selective and look at you. So if you're bored, please look bored so that I can know when, when to switch to something else. I want to talk about three similarities. First, two I'm gonna not talk about very much, uh, but, um, there is an obvious link between sound and image in both of them. And Levinus was very much influenced, he talks about visual music, he talks about built music in Dutch, and, um, and visual music is a, has its own history. Uh, and uh, Steiner and, uh, and Woody talk much less about it, but they also are very, really busy with ways that the sound is translated directly into image in, in all kinds of ways. And they also were thinking of ways how to make this performable, playable. Uh, and there's this whole history, which is sort of, yeah, I can also give like talks about this, but I will not. So, so I'm just gonna just look at it a little, tiny bit, but this is a whole history of people thinking of ways that you could actually play your visual music. So this is Wallace Remington, the guy from the uh, beginning of the 20th century, who built this, uh, this color organ. So it's basically, instead of making sound, it projects colored light. So you hit the keys, uh, here also at the bottom you see the keys, but then all linked to particular colors. So his idea is that you could play color music by just using these keyboards and, and playing them. It's a whole story I'm not gonna talk about very long. 
Uh, this is Mary Helen Greenwald, uh, who had a similar idea uh, a bit later in the 1920s. There's lots of pioneers like this who also invented and patented all kinds of interfaces and machines. She's an incredible woman who designed and built all this stuff you know, in the 20s with, you know, like uh, doing engineering in the 20s as a sort of uh, woman from sort of a good family that was quite uh, incredible. And she had this vision of making this new art form, which for her was also light color or some kind of color music. So she's a really amazing uh, person also. And then there's uh, her sort of, um, uh, how to say, her concurrent uh, competitor, Thomas Wilfred. They, they were actually, they did more or less the same thing, but they were in sort of patent battles, like they were both claiming to have invented this new color art. So this is Thomas Wilfred performing and he also built these devices which you could play uh, as a kind of yeah, light color organ, all these kind of things. Um, uh, so yeah, that's really history. And then this, this, uh, this is an image of Charles Dockham, uh, who is much less well known than these other people I, I talked about before. But I chose this image because it's, this is actually quite close in the way it works than what I think this luminodynamic machine of Levinas did. I've seen the machine, I've never seen it working, but inside it basically, well, it, it was less complicated and sophisticated, I think, than this device, but it's basically a bunch of flight projectors and slides and all kinds of electromechanical devices which could be programmed. Uh, which can basically yeah, do a very complicated abstract slideshow with sort of different light effects. So it was a machine sort of big like this. I know it because it was in the basement of the Royal Conservatory in The Hague where I studied and it was there to be restored and this never happened. And then after I think 10 years it being there in the basement, the, the daughter and the son of Livinus came to get it back because they were frustrated, nothing happened with it. And now I don't know, like now it seems to be in a container. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we hope one day this machine will be restored, but yeah, we will, will know. This is Charles Locke. Okay, so I talked about similarities. The first is this idea, I think this idea of visual music in whatever shape. Another idea, these are, um, this is basically a kind of placeholder image, um, is that both uh, Steiner and Livinus had a very strong social aspect of their, not so much of their work they showed in the end, but of their practice. Like Levinas was very uh, committed in this free academy to making art accessible to all kinds of people, also in his own work. This, this was really a factor. And Steiner and Woody, they were not only amazing artists, but also they were very important in sort of shaping the whole context of video art and, you know, this network and hooking up with all kinds of people. So they, it's not only through their work that they, I think they influence lots of people, but also just do, through their being and, and sort of yeah, engaging with their environment. Um, so I'm going to skip some images very quickly. Yep. Um, so I talked about two similarities, visual music, the strong sort of social aspects of their practice. And then the last thing I want to talk about, and I can talk about this for a long time, but I have to also look a bit at sort of the real situation in this room and the nice weather, et cetera, and the, the clock, uh, is this idea of the dialogue with the tools. And um, that's something which also really, yeah, I talked about it also about already my own sort of uh, projects which I call Dialogues with Machines, not knowing that Dialogue with the Tools was already a phrase that existed. Um, and it's basically the idea that, um, well, the, the sort of naive idea of, of, of engineering, let's say, that okay, I'm an artist, I have intuition, I have a brilliant idea, and then I ask an engineer to make me the tool to realize this idea, and then we make the work where this idea is realized. I am an artist. If this happened, I mean, this never happened to me uh, because I don't think this worked like that. But also, I think that would be very boring because if I have this idea and the end result is the same as what I imagined, why bother? Like, the, you can become a conceptual artist, you can write it down and then move on. You don't have to make it. So, and what's interesting with, if, if you look at the practice of, uh, of um, Levinas, like the way he was constantly inventing new tools or new ways to paint with light, and if you look at the practice of Steiner and Woody, it's very much the other way around. It's actually the machines which contribute also to the generation of the ideas. I mean, these ideas were not possible without having these tools to realize them or to even sort of 
come up with them. So I, I was really interested in this idea of, of yeah, these uh, ideas of machines having some kind of agency or some kind of contribution to the creative process, where this, uh, this idea came from, come from. And then, I, if you go back a really long way, this is 1843, this is Ada Lovelace, who was uh, the first programmer, like she wrote a book about uh, Charles Babbage, who invented this mechanical computer, and then she wrote software for this mechanical computer, which hadn't even been built, but she sort of imagined how you could use it to do algorithms and calculate things, I mean, amazing uh, person. Um, and then uh, she wrote a commentary on this invention where she also, you know, reflects a bit on what this computer would do, because basically it's a precursor of the computers we now have, like digital computers. Uh, so she has beautiful things because, of course, the computer was a mechanical machine, so it looks a bit like the Jacquard loom, you know, like these weaving machines which they had, which were also automatic. Uh, so she has this beautiful description of this computer where she says, well, it, we it weaves algebraical patterns just as the Jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. So you have to imagine these beautiful, you know, textiles being woven. Um, and then she actually, oh, these, sorry, these are is a representation of her first program, she imagines. And then I have, actually have some text. And then the bit I'm interested in here is here, in the second uh, paragraph, where she says, the analytical engine, so that's this computer, which was invented, has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. So she says, well, computers cannot invent or come up with new stuff. They can only, um, uh, uh, it, it can only follow analysis. So she talks a bit in mathematical terms. You can, well, you can basically just program it. Uh, what you, if you know how to do something, then you can program it. So this computer will never be able to do anything itself. But then later she says, I don't know if it's on this slide, um, I mostly try to avoid showing text on the screen. So I'm gonna go back to Ada, hop. So I can just read you the text, it's more easy. Um, but then she says, but it is different because it can make available what we are already acquainted with, but in a different way. And then she says, in, so distributing and combining the truth and the formulae of analysis, they become more easily and rapidly amenable to the mechanical combination of the engines. The relations and the nature of many subjects in that science are necessarily thrown into new lights and more profoundly investigated. This is an indirect and somewhat speculative consequences of such an invention. So basically she says, well, you know, these computers will not create anything new, but what they can do, they can make things available in a new way, like things we already know, and then allow new connections to happen. And this will be the way in which computers will contribute to our knowledge. She wrote this in 1843, so that is sort of, this is 100 years before the first digital computer. It's way before the internet. And I think she sort of, well, she says it's somewhat speculative. You think, well, come on, yeah. But I think she's very right also if you think now of things like ChatGPT and all this, you know, like image remixing machines we, have, we now call AI. Uh, but yeah, I think it's she already sort of in, in, imagine some of these things might happen. Um, okay, so this is from a completely different world. This guy is George Philbrick. I have to really look at the time because I can talk about his inventions and ideas forever. I will not. I will try to be brief and uh, explain things. And uh, he was also thinking about computers, but he was thinking about analog computers. And analog computers are not like the computers which we now have, where you type in symbols and you program things and they work with, you know, numbers. Analog computers are more like synthesizers. Like they basically, they, you can sort of hook up a circuit and then it behaves as a model, an electronic model of some kind of system. Uh, so George Philbrick was interested in these things. He built one of the first. So this was in uh, before the second role, like 38. So he built this electronic model of some kind of process. So that could be, for instance, a factory or uh, some kind of um, yeah, chemical plant, like things like that. And then you had these knobs. And so you could sort of tweak parameters of this chemical factory and then see on the there's a screen up there, the oscilloscope. So you have a little screen with a, with a line on it and you could see the movement of the line. It would sort of show you how this factory, you know, the production or the temperature, how it would change. 
So you can basically, like a synthesizer, you're jamming, but instead of creating sound, you're creating a, a behavior of a factory. Um, so, and, then, and the idea of this is this is real time, so you, this was doing the same calculation like 20 times a second, so you could just see it and turn the knobs and then you could see in real time, you could explore. This is 1938, before digital computers existed. Um, so he invented this and then uh, during the Second World War, of course, he was working also for the army and thinking about, you know, at that time they were thinking about how do we shoot these planes out of the sky, the planes move very fast, humans are slow, perhaps we can you hook up a radar to a gun automatically and how do we do this? And that's the similar kind of control technology and that's what he was interested in. Uh, and then, um, so it's about these kind of things, um, and then in a report about all the work they did during the Second World War, they were thinking, yeah, wouldn't it be great to have like some device where you can make these electronic models of, for instance, a plane or a factory or all those kind of things, but that you don't have to make a new device every time you want to investigate a new thing. So, he, I mean, I'm not going to read this text, um, but basically what he's proposing here, and this was 47, uh, is this thing what he calls the super simulator and it's basically like a synthesizer where you have the little modules and you have cables and you can just connect them up and then every time you want to do something else you just change the connection but you don't have to make a new machine. So he basically invented the modular synthesizer but this was not only for sound, this was called an analog computer. Um, and then he also was the first, one of the first to actually sell these so he, he built little black boxes and then one box would, for instance, add two signals, one box would multiply two signals, one box would do integration, and then you can basically hook up these things and then you can translate an equation into an arrangement of boxes, so you don't have to understand this equation anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm not very good at math, but I can now translate really complicated equations which make people afraid if you put them on the screen. But I can, comp like I'm, I'm working with things like this as well. So then I translate it into an arrangement of these modules so do, and then I can forget about the equation and just see what it does. And that's exactly the idea of any computer that you don't have to actually solve these things yourself. You just program it. And this way the programming is done by linking up these black boxes. Uh, so this is yeah, one of the first journals they made, uh, Landslide for Little Black Boxes. I mean, he was a great uh, writer as well. And the journal is called The Lightning Empiricist, which I think is a great word. Like lightning is, you know, blixem, it's like electricity. It's also fast, and lightning fast. And then empiricist is like we're doing research, like we're investigating electronic models. Um, so yeah, this is another uh, edition of, this, of their same journal, advocating electronic models at least until livelier instrumentalities emerge, which I find, yeah, the whole vibe around this thing I think is completely great. Um, and he had this idea of lightning empiricism, which is also a way that together with the machine, the engineer and the machine, they explore the behavior of this model. So there's a lot of like it's not that the engineer already knows, like he's learning from the interaction with his machine, he's exploring and then he or she, and then after the exploring, they think, okay, now we know how to have to build this plane, or now we know how we have to control uh, this factory, because that's the kind of thing they were interested in. And what's also interesting about the fill brick is that it's a lot about feedback, direct feedback from a good display where you see the graphs, like the mathematical uh, curves. Um, well, and then there's other people I'm not going to talk about. This is a, an English guy a bit later who also really thought about, you know, exploring this interaction with the machine, but the idea basically comes from this George Philbrick. Um, I'm also just going to skip this. Uh, because then we get to the synthesizers. And of course, synthesizers are also, like this is an audio synthesizer, the Moog like one of the first audio synthesizers, you have the Buchla, you have a few of these brands, now you can buy little modules again, like this Eurorack uh, people, it's more or less the same idea. And all these first inventors of these systems, these commercial synthesizer systems like Moog, Buchla, they all talked about analog computing as their inspiration, like ARP, for instance, also uh, Alan Perlman is the guy's name behind ARP, is not a synthesizer brand, he worked for Philbrick for 20 years. So all these ideas of analog computing, they went into this idea of the modular synthesizer, and that's how 
Yeah, we know about them. If I explain to people what an analog computer is, it's like a synthesizer, but doing math instead of creating sound. But it's also because it's really the same, in a way, the same device, you could say. So the idea is the same. You have all these modules to do operations on sound, uh, in this case, and you program it by linking these operations in a certain order, and then it does that stuff real time. And you still have to imagine, like, these pictures are from the 60s, 70s. Real-time computing started happening in the 80s or the 90s. So until then, uh, everything which was real-time was analog for a very, very long time. Um, and then this is uh, Sandin, a colleague of Steiner and Woody, uh, also a colleague of uh, Steve Rudd and Bill Etra, who also developed, inspired by the Moog, inspired by analog computers, his own modeler, um, uh, image processor, he called it. Um, and then we get back to this with Etra device. This is Bill Etra working with it. And it's, it's yeah, it looks a bit like an analog computer. It's also modeler. You can also program it with patch cables. And it was then, but instead of uh, programming sounds, you program like video manipulations of the image. And then uh, this is from the manual. It's only about the first line. The Red Etra synthesizer is a video analog computer. So it really comes from that tradition. And also what's really interesting, so it's really about uh, real time. And then there's this beautiful quote also from the Rut Etra man manual where they talk about synthesizer Zen. You become the feedback circuit uh, where he talks about like on the synthesizer, there's no, well, I, I will just read it to you. Uh, Most variable control knobs on the synthesizer have no reference scales on the panel. Instructions for operating them are given here in approximate numbers of turns. Experience shows, however, that with your hands on the controls and your eyes on the image, as it changes on a monitor screen, you become part of the system, acting as the controller in a feedback loop, the same way you drive your car. Happy driving. So it's basically, well, don't mess with writing down all the settings or whatever. You just, you know, you look at your screen, you put your hand on these knobs and you just go. That's basically the ethics of, I think, a lot of these analog synthesizer people, uh, if it's uh, audio or uh, video. Uh, so here we come back to the Red Etter, this is Steiner, this is Woody, the portrait. And then I'm going to actually skip these because there's some later scientists who said similar things. And then this is my studio. Uh, I made a new film with this, with the premiere is 23rd of May, which is in a week and a half in I, please come. I'm plugging myself, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but the reason I showed this image is that I was very much like on the right. This is an old analog computer from 1963, which I restored. And then there, this thing with all these cables there is a modern analog computer, which I built myself which can actually generate video signals. So it works with much faster signals, which can become images. And then the images I generate are also all generated real time. So this is the first time there was no rendering whatsoever. It's everything is just real time. I'm sort of playing real time, making complicated systems which play for me, but then I play those systems. Uh, and I have a record button. So if I like it, I go record and then record so it is great really i mean it really changed my mind to work with images in real time so i'm i'm part of the feedback loop controlling these knobs over there and i'm looking at this high resolution screen where i see the images as it, as it becomes when i record it so that's really a project which was uh, inspired by those things i'm gonna just show this is just some experiments i did this is not the whole part of the film Uh, it's a capture card, like it's you all well, this the complicated device. Yeah, it's actually a complicated question. We talked about it, but then you were not there, there yet before. Uh, that's an actually a very good question, um, <laughs> but it's also a bit of a nerdy question. So perhaps we can talk about it afterwards. But I have a device which is called a stroke to raster converter, which basically converts this oscilloscope is like looks like drawing you can say all these lines are then converted into video and those devices are quite rare and the reason i used one is that if you film an oscilloscope like the tubes which Philbrick was using it's basically a television they're all monochrome like you can't do that in color uh, and I, I i really like color and i get sad when i have to make a, a black and white film so 
So I was really frustrated that I couldn't do this uh, in color until somebody pointed me to this machine and until I found one. And they're really rare. They come, the one I have comes from a flight simulator. And they, yeah, they're, they're really, uh, oops, um, quite rare uh, devices. Uh, and then, yeah, and then that turns it into digital video, which then I capture on the computer. Okay, I'm uh, trying to look a bit at the level of fatigue. Um, <laughs> Um, but I'm sort of done actually because the last thing I, no, yeah, I still have a few things, but um, so I talked about this idea of real time interaction and becoming part of the feedback loop and this as a kind of dialogue with machines, which is a big part of what um, uh, Steiner and Woody were talking about when they talked about the dialogue with the tools. I have to go back a little bit because actually I skipped these images because I have some quotes by Woody. Uh, and Stein, I mean, there's interviews with both of them, and then Woody is mostly talking because he was the most verbal or the most taking the space. I don't know what, what, what the relation really was at that time. Um, so I just have a quote from 1976. Our work is a dialogue between the tool and the image. So we would not preconceive an image, uh, separately make a conscious model of it, and then try to match it as other people do. That's a bit what I said before of, you know, the engineer, like we artist things of an image and we make it. They said, well, we don't do this. We would rather make a tool and dialogue with it. That's how we belong with the family of people who would find images like found objects. But it's more complex because we sometimes design the tools and so we do conceptual work as well. And a much later quote, in order to present illusionist work like narrative, there has to be a means to present it, which are real, mechanical. And this is also true of showing an image which is abstract in form. Its image is not there to deceive you, but to reveal the means of making it. It's honesty, I'd like to think. The system is a participatory process in which tools give you abstract material and you're there maybe to form it, but the tool and you have the same significance. We always called what we were doing as dialogues with the tools. Sometimes we said that the tools were our teachers. We realized that tools and later the computer incorporated art. They were the art stars. We were completely infatuated with how the tools actually emulated artist, artist thinking, especially within the modernist tradition. This may be an exaggeration, but we saw the tools produce structures that we did not invent. And that reminds me of a quote of Phil Brick, the first guy I started with about analog computing, which Wu wrote at some point. Um, if you want results, promote a free interchange of ideas with the analog machine. All that it may sound, the computer will frequently make suggestions at an engineering level when an understanding develops. Take it from me, it can even invent, but not by itself. So that's exactly, I mean, I'm pretty sure they never read Philbrick. Philbrick is quite obscure, but the, the ethos is really the same. I mean, that's really, I think, really part of this interactive working with these analog uh, machines. Um, so that's one part I talked about, like this idea of the feedback loop, the dialogue with machine. And then the idea of, of a dialogue, of course, also means that there is something to have a dialogue with. Um, and then we come to Namjoon Paik. We talked about him at the beginning when Livinus uh, met Paik in Stockhausen uh, in the mid 60s after video art had just started. And Paik talks about the other. And the other is actually engineering. So I have a quote by Nam Jung Paik. I am always overwhelmed by my engineering. My TVs are more the artist than I am. I can compose something through technology that is higher than my personality or lower than my personality. In painting, you can compose as much as you want, but the Kooning cannot make anything that is deeper or more profound than what he has inside himself. But in engineering, there's always the other. The other, it is not you. Your work is not yourself. Sometimes your work has nothing to do with yourself. So this is him lying beneath his work. Um, yeah, I'm hesitating to stop here. <laughs> because I'm, I think it's perhaps a good moment to stop. Uh, the things I have prepared, but I, I will not talk about is that also in philosophy, philosophers have also thought about these things, but they said most, more or less the same thing. So I think we can stop here. Thank you.
Are there any questions, remarks, complaints? Uh, that's. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. no, there's a few. I mean, there's a whole branch of philosophy. I'm not gonna, okay, I'm gonna try talking about these things without doing the talk. No, this is uh, Edwin Hutchins, who's a con cognitive anthropologist, and he's sitting in the cockpit of a TGV train because he was studying how, for instance, uh, sailors work together as a group, but also work with their tools and how actually he talks about distributed cognition. So that's what we think, or the traditional model is, is that we are like humans are like we just kind of skin bag and we have a brain that everything we think of is in our brain. The idea of distributed cognition is that actually a lot of things we think of are actually in our environment because we made this environment. So like computers are an obvious example, but also already in a ship, just the fact of having a compass and you know this rudder and all these things. So there's people like him who, who, like he wrote his book, Cognition in the Wild, which is a great study of especially sailors, like as a group, how they navigate the world or how their intelligence is actually shaped, not so much by one person, but as a group, but by a group and their, the way of they interact through their technologies. And then there's Latour who talked about um, uh, um, ANT, actor network theory, theory. Also talking about how a lot of the actually the, the intelligence which we think people have actually is because of the environment. So it's also things we learn through our environment, for instance, or things we delegate uh, to the environment. Um, and then there's this guy, which I discovered quite recently, is Lambros Malafouris. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he wrote this fantastic book, How Things Shape the Mind. And he is, uh, I have to look up what he was. He is not a cognitive anthropologist. I think he's a cognitive archaeologist. So he's, a, he's interested in archaeology, and he's interested in how you can, through archaeology, understand the mind of people who have, yeah, lived long, long time ago. And for instance, he made a very detailed study of how uh, potters work, like when people, you know, work with clay, and if you make a pot how actually a lot of that process is not is also controlled by the material and how it's yeah like he has very interesting uh, uh, thoughts about it so there's a very short version of it. <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I, one of the things I skipped was a bridge like that. It's this guy, like I talked about Philbrick, which is his early analog computing guy. I'm skipping my slides. And then I found, so this is, yeah, the analog computing stuff. And then the, the earliest example I found of this idea of a dialogue somehow was actually from this guy, Stanislav Ulam who was a Polish mathematician. He was involved in the Manhattan Project, so he did a lot of the modeling for the atom bomb and these kind of things. And he was a, a brilliant mathematician, and he was also thinking about how to use computers. And then uh, digital computers for a very long time uh, were like, for instance, if you had a university, you had this, this one mainframe computer, and it was somewhere in a building, and there was a kind of priesthood around them. Like, you would never use these machines yourself. You would sort of deliver the code to the priesthood, who would then sort of give it, offer it to the machine, and then the machine would sort of, you know, as an oracle, spit out paper, and then you had your results. So there was sort of the opposite of a dialogue. I mean, it's really like you, this, you, you don't even touch the machine. Um, and uh, Stanislav Ulam was one of the first, I, the, the first I'm aware of who thought of a very different way of working also with digital computers, more in an interactive way. And part of the reason he could think that is that he worked uh, with one of the first, well, important early digital computer, which is called the Whirlwind, which was like the first computer which was um, uh, designed or developed to do things in real time. And the thing they did in real time was monitor the sky because they were afraid of the Russian rockets. So it's incredible. I mean, it's a whole history which is super interesting. Like basically the reason why IBM for decades was the biggest computer manufacturer is that they got the contract for these first, and this cost billions and billions of dollars. I mean, it's crazy stuff. 
Um, but then this Talas Bulan Ulam, he had this idea of what he called synergesis. So I'm looking for this quote. Uh, where it's 1960, so it's really very early. Uh, instead of using the machine as a robot, or as it were, as a player piano, whose tunes are written in advance, the machine could be kept in constant communication with an intelligent operator who changes even the logical nature of the problem during the course of a computation at will after evaluating the results which the machine provides. So it's also the idea that instead of using the computer as a tool where if you already know what you will calculate, you program it and then you get the result, that you can also use it as a tool more to explore things. Like if you don't know, but you're sort of looking for something, then you can do lots of different explorations and then yeah, choose a direction. So it's very close to turning the knobs on an analog machine. And they were thinking of, yeah, that it, perhaps with digital computers, you can also do such thing. And in my own work, I got um, really interested in, in digital compute, you know, digital things through like things, for instance, like you had this field of science called artificial life, where you had all this, this model of, you know, populations or biological processes. And what I found amazing is that these play out on the screen in real time and you can do things with them. And so this, I saw this in the 90s, which is the moment where computers sort of became available and, you know, accessible and things could be sort of done in real time. Um, so that's, uh, so I think a lot of that ethos and also analog computers at some point died and they more or less died at the moment when this kind of real time interaction with the machine became possible on digital computers. And then very often you had these computing centers or interaction labs, they sort of morphed from analog to this kind of digital modeling. There's lots of people um, like for instance, Dan Sandin, he started, you know, with his image uh, processor. And at some point he invented the cave, which is the first virtual reality environment for groups, which, where you could simulate a plane and be in it. And in a way that's not so far from analog computing and also the ethos of analog computing is that you can really explore things in, in real time. Uh, and there's lots of examples of like this analog computing gurus sort of moving into that kind of real time computing, uh, like somewhere in the nineties. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but there's one answer I think of, uh, yeah, <laughs> of how the bridge, yeah, could work or work for me. Any other questions? Let's have drinks. It's uh, nice weather. It's uh, we've done our duty. It's Friday afternoon. <laughs> well, thank you.